four and a half years. So, and John's work in Milwaukee is most noted for uh, is removing the turkeys freeway. And I have to say, when I was a Marquette student, I got my car up at school for the very first time, and I really liked the expressway directly to the parking say, pick and save parking lot. Uh, I was a little disappointed to hear that it was being removed because it was a benefit to those cars. Uh, but now that it's gone, and I go back up to Milwaukee for uh, basketball games, I really see the growth and his vision that he had when he took that, that step. So college kids can go shopping at the local grocery store using their uh, home to life. And, and it's really turned in and uh, brought in the new growth to the north of the city of Milwaukee. So without further ado, I'm just going to let John take over here. And uh, so help me welcome John to the podium. Uh, 
but anyway, we ended up applying this rural standard, and the rural standard that made sense was how do we build a road so people can travel safely at whatever the capacity, um, whatever the uh, speed of the vehicles are, they tried to accommodate it. Eventually there were crashes because people were driving too fast uh, to make the road bigger in the rural context. But the purpose of the road in the rural context was really only one, moving the vehicles. But as soon as you go into the urban context, an urban thoroughfare, traditionally throughout human history, going back even thousands of years, has had three basic purposes. One is movement of vehicles, whether they're chariots or motor vehicles, um, but also selling things, the market purpose, and the social function, like you have with Main Street, like you have with Michigan Avenue, State Street in Chicago, um, Wisconsin Avenue in Milwaukee, whatever. And so, so we ended up with this model, with this is, these are streets in Brookfield, Marlin Road and Blue Mound Road, where the street is only for moving vehicles. There's no facilities for pedestrians. I think you can legally walk along the edge of that road, but you would uh, not feel very comfortable. You might feel like you were a criminal suspect or something if you were doing it. Um, and so the road has lost its social purpose. It's lost its economic purpose. It gets you to where the market stuff is eventually, but the road itself is no longer part of the process. That doesn't work very well. And we can see it with data that's coming out since the recession started in 2008, that um, actually the urban, the traditional urban street with mixed use uh, is valuable real estate. It's tended to lose less value and has gained more value than uh, the kind of separate use uh, development that happened over uh, the last 40, 50 years. This is Wicker Park in Chicago, and this is a street, the streets here, North Avenue, Milwaukee Avenue, Damon Avenue, they come together right near the Blue Line Damon stop. It's a very pedestrian-oriented neighborhood. But these are big streets. They're carrying 25, 30,000 cars a day. Uh, North Avenue has two moving lanes in each direction, but the other two only have one moving lane in each direction at this point. And they, uh, they have parking all day, even at rush hour, because the retailers had more influence over the aldermen than the traffic planners did. And so the idea that the road needed to move lots of traffic in rush hour, it's important, but it wasn't as important as the retailers getting people to park and buy stuff at their stores in rush hour. So there, there was a collision of political will, and the retailers came out on top. But somehow it all works. You go there on a Friday night or a Thursday night or even a Wednesday night on a, on a summer day like this, and you're going to find the restaurants are packed, the people are packed, it's a very congested street, but it's not just congested with traffic. It's congested with money and customers, high real estate values, uh, and tax base for the city of Chicago uh, and the county of Chicago and all the other governments that feast upon the tax base of uh, Chicago. Um, and you have a similar thing in uh, Dundas Street in Toronto, where you have the Dundas streetcar line, it's a major streetcar line, it goes through Chinatown. There's one moving lane in each direction, there's parking on each side. Uh, it's crowded, it's congested. Um, but it, it, works for the, it, it works in terms of creating value and creating customers and creating cash, creating an enjoyable social scene. It's all there. Now, you know, it's not heaven on earth, there's problems. Um, but it, uh, it somehow comes together. So before correcting this problem of the congestion, it's important to think about what the congestion is. Congestion is a little bit like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And if all you had was through traffic on that street and nobody was stopping to buy anything or visiting or doing anything that added value to the neighborhood, then there would be uh, a cause for concern. You know, what did that congestion really do for the neighborhood? But a 
lot of the congestion in a neighborhood like this is actually um, useful and valuable. Um, so it is crowded. And you know, it kind of reminds me of what Yogi Berra said uh, about New York City one time. He said uh, that uh, nobody wants to go to New York anymore. It's too crowded. You know, and that's sort of the uh, problem that we have. But when we look at the, the metrics that we use, which make a lot of sense maybe in the countryside, but we use them in the city, uh, then all kinds of strange things happen. And this is a chart that has to do with mobility. There's other versions of it. Here's one from Alaska that's a little simpler to read, the Alaska DOT. But you have high mobility with the bigger roads, but not that many much, not that much of the traffic is using them, the collectors, and then low mobility with the local grid. But the, this, this chart puts a high value on long trips and no value on short trips. And so you have the city with its street grid and people living fairly close together and living close to their work. And this, doesn't, this methodology doesn't value that at all. And so you end up with a situation where the government is saying, well, if you take a 30-mile trip and, you, and it goes faster, we'll measure the leisure time you save and put a value on that. You know, if you can make it 28 minutes instead of 33 minutes, that's a good, that's a good reason to invest in a facility. And then somebody that lives right across the street from the workplace, and all they have to do is walk across the street. There's no value. There's no value put on that trip whatsoever. And so that's why we need to think differently. Now, one thing that I, I do want to say about this before I go on further is that there has been an unfortunate argument that's almost like World War I trench warfare for the last 20, 30 years. And it's understandable why the warfare happened. And a lot of the characters involved in the, in the battle you know, have good intentions and in some cases are brilliant people. You know, like Patrick Moynihan, the senator from New York, who came up with the idea of iced tea. And in the first version of iced tea, the modal split was 80-20. 80 for roads, 20 for everything else, mostly transit. And that was the battleground. And that battleground has gone on. Ice T2 T and then T3. And uh, the battle continues as we are sitting here today, uh, you know, over this 80-20 split. And now they, nothing is passing, apparently, and so the battle will go on into the future. But that's unfortunate because, actually, the battle shouldn't be about whether or not we spend money on pavement or transit, although, you know, that's an argument that you have to have to some extent. We need pavement. Every street that people love in America, every alley, every sidewalk, uh, every lane, that people enjoy and take pictures of and all that. They're all they're, they're street projects, they're road projects. And the idea that somehow a street grid with all the pavement involved in that, Chicago's street grid is an enormous amount of pavement. I'm gonna, I'm gonna measure sometime and figure out whether there's more mileage in the street grid in Chicago than there is in the interstate highway system. I suspect there would be. So maybe not, I don't know, somebody, somebody know the answer to that? Well, I, we'll talk about it later. But, um, but there's a lot of things that can be paved. And the, the idea that pavement is out there, that's been a failing of the environmental movement. To take the position that somehow pavement is bad, transit is good, and then we need to have this trench warfare that goes on forever where each side demonizes the other. And that really needs to end. And that's why at CNU we're focusing more and more on streets on finding good things about streets, the kind of streets that we would like to see, and the frame we're using is what adds value. And why does that matter? That matters because local officials are a little short on cash. Local officials need money, and they need tax base, and they're not getting revenue sharing. That was eliminated, that was started under Nixon, ended under Reagan. I used to be in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors is all about dreaming up schemes to 
have a urban, an urban agenda that basically translates into having money drip into the cities. And so, and, and there's one program that's been around for a long time now, the Black Grant Program. All of the money for the Black Grant Program that goes to the city of Detroit is used for demolition of houses, which they don't keep up with, but uh, which actually they shouldn't try to keep up with it. And the demolition contractors all hang around the city council in Detroit to make sure that all of it is spent on demolition. And that's an example of those programs. But most cities get very little money from the federal government. It is an absolute myth. Less than 5% on average comes from the federal government, and most of that is in housing. So they're not getting a lot of money, unless they run a big transit system and they get a little bit more money here than uh, some places. But uh, so there really isn't a lot of federal money coming to cities, and the states, which got a lot of federal money, uh, but aren't so much anymore and don't have their own money, they're cutting back on all the sharing programs that they have in the states. So cities need tax picks. And I, when I was mayor of Milwaukee, in 1988 I was elected, and my public works director, um, Dave Kimmel, came in with a plan for $58 million worth of right turn lane improvements, and which involved considerable demolition and uh, to speed up the traffic. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I had been part of the uh, anti-freeway movement in Milwaukee when I was in the legislature, and so I think he knew that, but uh, anyway. <laughs> He presented this to me. I, I was skeptical. You know, okay, how much demolition do you want to do? How many buildings are going to come down? Let's get the valuations on those buildings. And then they came back again, and we had the valuations. I said, all right, how many, there were three guys with them. How many of you guys uh, are planning on drawing a pension when you retire from the city of Milwaukee? And they looked at me, well, of course we're going to draw our pensions. I said, well, if you're in, if you want to draw your pension, then why do you want to tear the tax base down that's going to pay your pension? You know, and they'd never thought of it that way before, and I never did convince Kimmel. But, uh, but he, he went on and got a great job at Marquette uh, teaching the students there. And, and he's, a, he's a wonderful guy, we just didn't agree. But, uh, but then the next guy who came in, who was one of his assistants, kind of got it from that. You know, that, these city, and he got it partly because at the very same time there was an article in the paper about how the city of Philadelphia might skip a pension payment. That was when Wilson, not so good, was mayor of, uh, of Philadelphia. And they were just about to go under. So anyway, adding value, any infrastructure that's built in a city needs to consider that before it's approved. Does it add value? And is it really necessary in a city? You know, if you use the rural calculation, this is in uh, Germany, um, Wooster, Germany. And if everybody drove, it fills up the whole street for a couple of blocks. If the same number of people rode in a bus, that's how big it is. And then the picture on the right, if people were biking and, and walking, that's how much space it would take up. It's a different context. And so when you're in a city, you have a little bit more complexity to the transportation thing. And just counting cars and vehicles isn't going to solve the problem. Now, a lot of people think that people that are for transit, the environment, all that, they're on the lefty side of the argument and people that want to build big roads everywhere are somehow on the right wing side of the argument. But I just wanted to point out, Corbusier, did the first drawing, the, the French, actually, Swiss uh, designer, did the first drawing of a great separated highway in 1922. And it, it was probably more de descriptive or, or predictive than it was that he actually meant this is the design that everybody should do. But he, uh, he wanted to build this on the west side of Paris with another form of technology, the steel and grit glass building, so you uh, didn't have to have a gravity-held foundation, you could do it with structure. And it got all the pedestrians out of the way, and basically 
like that uh, little cartoon we had before. And it's been built, particularly in the U.S. This is in Crystal City near the Reagan Airport. Uh, you can't walk along this street, although they're about to change it. They have a plan to make it into a regular boulevard with sidewalks. Uh, but the, it was Corbusier's idea. And Corbusier was a socialist. Now, here's the other great enthusiast for great separated highways, Oscar Niemeyer, who's a member of the Communist Party. I don't want to sound like Joe McCarthy, but, uh, <laughs> but he is. He's 104 years old. He's a card-carrying member. He's a Brazilian, but he lives in Paris most of the time. He donated his architectural services, which are of great value, to the French Communist Party and built their building in Paris, which is a beautiful building, actually. But when it came to city planning, he created the most dreadful, dismal place uh, of any big city on earth. Well, you know, there might be some that are worth uh, If you go to Mogadishu and uh, Somalia, it's probably worse. But uh, Brasilia, with uh, almost all this major thoroughfares are grade separated. The buildings are separated with the tower in the park. And, uh, and all of the life of the city is in the slums around it. There's nothing much going on in the city itself. And you can see a replica of this if you go to Albany, New York, in the Empire State uh, Plaza in the middle of Albany, where they tore down a couple of neighborhoods just to build a giant plaza. And the model for this kind of road building has ended up with this drawing, where you've got the freeway, the collective road, the service road, the arterial road. Those are all the things that are easily funded that naturally fit in the scope of Federal Highway Administration or the ASHTO or the state DOTs. Uh, the local roads in the upper left-hand corner, that's the stuff that really doesn't, you really have to work, you have to have your congressman fight to get that stuff into the, into the funding mixture. And that's the bias again of the long trip, the bias against road networks, street networks, as opposed to trying to put everything in a few roads. And the idea that funneling traffic into a few giant facilities would solve the problem is, uh, it really doesn't work that way. It doesn't work so well. When Rita was about, Hurricane Rita was about to hit Houston, almost everybody tried to get on the freeway system to get out of town, and it didn't work. It just came to a halt, because too many people were trying to do too few roads. Now, if the network the street network was still intact, a lot of it isn't, uh, then people can use the complexity of the street grid to evacuate. And so you end up with uh, you know, a situation like this. At least that's the way it looks in the mind of the, the driver. But even at the arterial level, there are problems. And Eric Dumbaugh, who you ought to have come and speak to you sometime, from Florida Atlantic University, uh, and used to be at the Texas Transportation Institute. He's done a lot of work on clear zones and on lane widths and on safety and the difference between the network and, and uh, trying to load all the traffic in one place. And, but this is the model that we end up with over and over with the uh, big clear zones and no role for the pedestrian. And this is what becomes almost impossible to do now. This is... Uh, Kenny Connick Avenue in Milwaukee, but it's the standard uh, street that you would have learned in civil engineering school for a thoroughfare back in the 1920s. Two rod streets, two rods from the center lane to the building line, 50 foot sidewalks, I mean 50 foot pavement, and eight foot sidewalks on each side, and then uh, retail on the first floors, and then low cost housing above before there was any federal agency before FHA, before HUD, before any of that stuff existed, you had low-cost forms, affordable housing that was being produced uh, in the marketplace. And sometimes, I don't have time to get into all that today, but it's not just traffic engineering that's involved in, in uh, uh, creating sprawl. The, the enforcement of separate use zoning through federal programs like FHA has a big impact on these things as well. And, you know, you take a street like Newberry Street, which produces 
hundreds of millions of dollars of retail sales in Boston. Uh, you couldn't build that without a variance in most of America. A and the, the uh, but now you can, if you use the ITE Urban Contact Street Guide, uh, which the FHWA voted for in our in Marshall and my meetings. Uh, it took a little persuasion, but they supported it. And it's available as an option, and I think eventually AASHTO will adopt, uh, maybe not it, but some form of it, uh, in their own green book. And so engineers have a right to get outside the box now and can do, in the urban context, do things that add value to the community. That it doesn't just have to be about the mathematics of flow. And then we have a smaller version of this, of the uh, ITE guide, which we just put out a few months ago. We actually, in January, we passed them out at TRB. And you can download this for free at cnu.org. It basically takes its cues from the, the larger green book, I mean the green colored book uh, by ITE. Now here's the street grid. And this is what we really need to study more and more to understand. Because it was engineers who did this. You know, it wasn't some hippie with a headband. You know, <laughs> engineers did this. It was designed by Pierre Lenfant, and it was amended by, Bur by Daniel Burnham to put the mall into it. But that's Washington, D.C. street grid. It's a great setting for real estate value. It was even a great setting for real estate value when they had a mayor like Mary and Barry, who was addicted to crack cocaine. It was still a good market for real estate, but it got better, of course, after he was gone. I'm not saying the streets are the only factor, but if you look at, if you look at, uh, if you look at that, and the same thing in Madison, uh, the street grid works pretty well for absorbing and uh, distributing traffic. There's no big facility roads in the Isthmus in Madison, but there are the state employees and the university. About 40,000 uh, uh, university and state employees all together working in this area, and because of the richness of the street grid, all the various streets, the traffic is able to distribute. But we always are trying to fix this stuff. So like at Bush Stadium, when they built it in St. Louis, it, they inserted ramps into the street grid of downtown uh, next to I-64, uh, extended them further maybe than they needed to, and brought them closer to the stadium maybe than they needed to. And contrast that with Wrigley Field, which draws 37,000, 40,000 fans every single game, and there's nothing near it other than the L and the city street grid. And somehow, somehow it works. They didn't try to solve all the problems. They just created a great baseball park a long time ago when they didn't know what they were doing. And it really worked. Except for one thing. They can't win there. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I just wanted to real quick, I'll run through some examples of things that, uh, a case study that I think is relevant to the ID work. This is um, in, in uh, Elgin, Illinois, Highway 20, which is a big facility, you can't walk across it, it's got all kinds of problems. And the city's considering putting in a street grid that would be roughly the same as the street grid in the rest of the, in the rest of the older part of the city, and open up more opportunity for retail, open up uh, 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 opportunity for density. But also, it would be a multi-way boulevard, so you would be able to have a higher speed facility in the middle four lanes, so you can still accommodate lots of traffic. And there'd be plenty of pavement uh, poured for that. Uh, and here's just an example of what you could do with it. And another thing, just so you know, that's starting to happen, uh, it's coming from the corporations themselves. This is. Uh, Cisco's campus in Santa Clara County, California, they have a housing problem. Their workers are traveling like 150 miles to get to work. Um, and nobody's given a permit to build anything in Santa Clara County, but Cisco can get permits. So they're putting in uh, 
They're putting in housing around their campus, and they're basically creating what amounts to a city. And they're going to put streets and blocks through it, and the, uh, the plan is uh, moving ahead. And the shopping malls, nobody's building any new shopping malls anymore. Uh, and that's, that trend started before the recession. What they're doing is converting them into lifestyle centers, which are sort of the developer's attempt at trying to create Main Street or trying to create a village center. And that involves streets and blocks and all these design concepts that come from the uh, pre-World War II period which are now worth knowing again. And here's Newtown, St. Charles, and Missouri, some other thing. And the retailers like this stuff, even Home Depot. This is a Home Depot in Halstead in Chicago, north of Fullerton. And it, uh, it has no visible parking. There's a big parking lot under it. You can get to it from the alley. There's just metered parking in front, escalators. Uh, it could be in Nordstrom's if you took the Home Depot sign off of it. They love Home Depot is doing great. Uh, uh, Walmart is even now thinking more in terms of urban stores. Uh, they're willing to build on sidewalks and actually have their buildings touch other buildings, something they never <laughs> were willing to do in the past. Uh, and some of the forms are coming back, like the terminated vista on streets. This is in Port Washington, Wisconsin. This was built out in the 1880s and 90s. Imagine the sophistication it would take today to build a street that looked like that. Um, or the Chicago Board of Trade on LaSalle, which you can see right here in Chicago. But it's coming back. Now, it's not quite there yet. This is Target at the Gaithersburg uh, uh, shopping mall. Uh, and around the corner, Kohl's, Terminated Vista, Main Street, social purpose of the street restored, retail purpose of the street restored. But I want to show you how bad it was. They're one of the richest cities in the world at the end of World War II was Detroit. And Detroit had a lot of problems throughout the last 60 years, so this isn't the only one. But this is the way it looked in 1946. This was a, it, right after the war, the most productive city during the war, providing war material for the US, for the British, for the Red Army, everybody that was fighting the Nazis and the Japanese. And uh, had 300 miles of streetcar, pedestrians everywhere. And, uh, but it was congested, it was crowded. So they solved that problem. It's a Fisher Expressway. And they built every expressway that Michigan DOT could dream up. This is Berlin in May of 1945. At the end of the war, 70% of the city is destroyed. Uh, that's the way it is now. There's no war damage except where they've deliberately left it as a historical mark. This is Warsaw. At the, in 1945, the end of war, all the buildings were destroyed except for a few, like the Bristol Hotel, where the German staff was. This is Warsaw now, all rebuilt. They've got some of those ugly socialist apartments they still have to remove. Uh, this is Rotterdam. Two days after the Dutch surrendered, Gehring sent the Luftwaffe in and bombed Rotterdam to the ground and took this picture and airdropped it over Paris. So the Parisians would know what was about to happen to them. Uh, this is Rotterdam now. It's all built up. It's all back. It's beautiful. It's an industrial city, and it's still beautiful. It's not a regular tourist city. This is Detroit. About 35% of the land is unoccupied by buildings that used to have buildings on it. We won World War II. It looks like, if you go to Detroit, it looks like maybe we were the epicenter of World War II. Uh, you know, there's a problem with some of the things that we've done. We need to change it. And real quickly, this is New Orleans, Claiborne Avenue, where Louis Satchmore Armstrong lived. 1966, they tore down the, the live oaks and put up this road. And it didn't add value to that neighborhood. You had 220 businesses, now you have 27 along that street. And uh, the city's now looking at putting the boulevard back in. Uh, probably have to be a multi-way boulevard to handle the traffic. That's okay. It doesn't have to be quaint. It can be a, a road that you can drive trucks on. Uh, but the most dramatic change of all is in Seoul, South Korea, where shortly after the Korean War, the Chungcheong Expressway was built through the middle of town. 150,000 cars a day. 
It was removed in 2003, and this is how it looks now. Uh, the river is restored. There's only two moving lanes of traffic on each side of the river. It used to be a major route. The grid absorbed it. The rich system of avenues and streets absorbed the traffic. Um, and here's the mayor who did it, Lee Young Bach. Look how happy he is. <laughs> he did something courageous and it worked, and now he's president of South Korea. He's probably not so happy as, as that job. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, w one of the things that happened in Chicago that I thought, oh man, we're moving in the wrong direction here, was when they closed off the uh, Queens Walk, but it's open again. And so things can move in the right direction. And I just wanted to leave you with this uh, last little project here. This is uh, I-55. They don't have the, the Illinois DOT doesn't have the money to rebuild it between I-94 and Lakeshore Drive. And it's it's a great separated freeway. Uh, you know, you can see where the lake is on the far right side. But the ugliest stretch of Lakeshore Drive is where I-55 comes in and basically makes it like a freeway. You go north, you go south, and Lakeshore Drive is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful major traffic facilities in the country. It carries a lot of traffic, but it's beautiful. People love it. It adds value to property, but not that section. So what at the, I mean at, uh, at CNU, uh, we're suggesting that this isn't good enough, and maybe instead of restoring the, or rebuilding this, they could instead put in a multi-way boulevard, have some great crossings, and restore the neighborhood, and the few seconds that are lost will be made up by the delight that people have from the complexity of the city being reborn and the, the value that will be added. Same thing with the Ohio Street feeder. All the freeway connections to downtown Chicago, except the Ohio uh, feeder, you look at all the streets, Jackson, Adams, Washington, all these ramps, as soon as you get off the freeway, within five feet of turning onto the street, the street is the same dimensions it is right there as it is 10 blocks to the east when you get into downtown. You're immediately in the urban context. And so the purpose of the city of Chicago isn't as the queuing place for the freeway. It's a place where commerce and value happens. And with the Ohio feeder ramp, it goes right up to Orlean Street and creates a, a real problem. So uh, this is another one where we're suggesting that they could consider improving it by putting a street that's at least part of it at grade uh, in the city context, like Octavia in San Francisco. This is a cross-section of that. And Logan Boulevard, for those of you from the Chicago area, know how beautiful it is. Um, and we should relearn how to make avenues and boulevards. Uh, they can move lots of traffic, but also add to the value of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, very much uh, for coming here today. And again, great presentation. Uh, we are about uh, five minutes away from meeting on the Wacker Drive tour, so if you are signed up for